You're listening to the Deep Purple Podcast, a fan podcast about one of the most legendary bands of all time, Deep Purple. We take a look at the music, history, and people behind the band Deep Purple and beyond. Welcome to the Deep Purple Podcast, the first and only podcast devoted to one of the greatest bands in rock history, Deep Purple. Today's episode is episode number 74, the Rod Evans Singles. And coming to you from the perfectly cromulent suburbs of Chicago, I'm your host, Nathan Beaudry. And coming to you from the (laughs) frustrated suburbs of Providence, (laughs) John... (laughs) Jeremiah Hill Matola. John, what? <laughs> Jeremoth, Jeremoth Hill. Jeremoth Matola. Hill. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. I know I'm going to know this uh, one when you say it. Yeah. What is, what is Jeremoth Hill? <laughs> it's the state's highest point at yes. 812 feet above sea level. And where is it? Um... I think it's I think it's in Cumberland. That's I don't have this right. in my little factoid sheet in front of me, but I believe that Jeremoth Hill is Or as a, we uh, from uh as we from neighboring town call it, Scumberland. I think we've been through that before. I've never Jeremoth Hill. Never I always thought that. it was funny as like eight hundred and twelve <laughs> feet above sea level. I must just make you know, people in uh in Colorado just laugh. 812 why feet. what how how far above sea level are are they i forgot well the the denver isn't like the mile high city or whatever so oh, it's yeah. five thousand plus feet over above sea level well you're just thinking about like places around here like or within driving distance like you drive to like new hampshire and there's like four thousand feet four thousand footers are like the yeah you know, the, the standard for like a difficult, uh, you know, climb or a mountain and our like highest elevation is like not even like a thousand feet. Well, it's even more than that. Like Mount Washington has got to be, uh, what's how, how high is Mount Washington? It is. I know that that is 6,288 feet. Well, the fact that it's called a but hill, I mean, I was saying like, it's not even a mountain, just hill. The- <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, when I, when we went to Disney world, uh, they, made a big deal because space mountain i think they said was like the mm-hmm. third highest point in florida to talking of jeez you know, it's a man-made object and that's talking about uh talking about flat areas but anyway we, yeah we had a bit of a technical oh, sorry. Yeah. what's that mm. jeremiah hill is in foster foster okay that sounds more believable foster gloucester foster gloucester um yeah, we had a few, yeah. a few technical issues starting up the show. We, we, we got a real early start, and now it's like an hour and a half later, and we're finally <laughs> starting the episode after an unrequested Windows update and some other technical issues. And we've, we've had a couple weeks yeah. off. Uh, to you, there will, it will be seamless. But to us, we haven't um, done a show in a, in a couple weeks, probably our longest stretch since the holidays last year. And uh, yeah, we're a little rusty, so hopefully we can we remember how to do this. We forgot how to do everything. Yeah, what else is new? <laughs> I forgot um, how to update my computer before a show, and then it's like the biggest update in history. <laughs> it's like, your your computer be going like, are you? Are I like when they make yet? recommendations. Like, yeah. so like, this will take a long time. They're like, if if after three hours this isn't done, please don't think it's wrong and shut off your computer. Like, this is just going to go on forever. Well, luckily. That was not the case. But don't so. you feel great knowing that you've got the most up-to-date operating system? I mean, th- th- this is going to be one of our best sounding shows ever because of that. I hope so. So, hey, if Minus you want... mystery buzzing that I have over here. I don't know if anybody... Yeah, hopefully the buzzing that. doesn't come off on the, on the, uh, on the final product. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Um, but if you want to keep up to date on the show, please make sure to subscribe in Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcatcher. And God, I haven't, tra- I haven't even checked the... Uh, the podcast reviews in a while i don't know i don't know where we're, we're doing there so um well in uh, apple we don't have anything new um i checked earlier oh you did nothing new. yeah i Come always, on, I always guys. check mondays yeah yeah bono's ego yeah, is the no, last no. review you guys we have so mm-hmm. many more listeners think of how many listeners we have that haven't written 
a, a, a review on Apple Podcasts, please do so. We need your help and support. And also, you, it, it, or if you just don't want to do that and would rather give us money, you can become a patron on Patreon and join this cast of characters. At the $25 Super Trooper tier, we have Steve Seaborg of NameOnAnything.com and AllTheWorldsOfStage.net. At the $20 Shades of Deep Pockets tier, Ryan M., as always. And at the $15 Highball Shooter tier, hey We've got a patron upgrade. Patron. hi Alan Bag is kicking it up to the $15 highball shooter tier, thus leaving the turn it up to $11 tier vacant and the $10 someone came tier vacant. Um, kicking it in with $6.66 this week, Richard Fusey, our PayPal, our trusty PayPal donor. So creating a, a new tier for this. He just kind of throws, he throws uh, some, uh, uh, donations here and there he was at the ten dollar now he's doing 666 i think he's just doing some fun uh some fun dollar amounts for us so thank you richard oh i like that we can call that the uh the uh let me see what's what's black uh, black sabbath born again tier <laughs> yeah well the n- number of the beast tier but um unfortunately oh, yeah, we're not an iron maiden podcast or else that would be a real easy one or um, the seventh star or like anything that involves a black sabbath and deep purple members Yes, we, we like they that. they weren't very, they weren't very like devilish. They were probably more satanic-ish imagery, like with Ian Gillen, which kind of seems weird if you think about it. But yeah, the the ugly baby tier, um, <laughs> at the five dollar money lend, lender tier, we've got Clay Wambacher, Greg Sealby, Frank Teelgard Mortensen, Mike Knowles, John Convery, Arthur Smith, German Heindel, and heyo. Hi-oh. Adrian Hernandez joining us via PayPal at the $5 money lender tier. Thank you so much. And hey, oh, fielding Fowler joining us at the $5 money lender tier. Thank you so much for Adrian and fielding. Really appreciate that. Coming in at the $3 nobody's perfect tier, Peter Gardot, Ian DeRosier, Mark Roback, Anton Glaving, and hey, oh, hi, oh. Will Porter. Thank you so much, Will, for joining our ranks via Patreon. We appreciate it. And at the $1 made-up name tier, we have Els Murders, Spacey Noodles, the Supernatural Leaky Mausoleum, and Michael Vader. Thank you very much to all of you guys. I really appreciate it. Oh, I was hoping for one more hey with the $1 tier. <laughs> I, we haven't had a new made up silly made up name in a while i don't know what michael vader's first episode was but wow yeah we we need we need new silly names maybe people are just intimidated by all these great made up names they don't feel like they can make up names as good they can they can or maybe you know what you can make you know what why don't you open up the uh 11 tier and have it be the uh top shelf made up names tier you can make up a name for that one hmm. whatever good you want to do so like big it. thanks to our brothers at the Deep Dive Podcast Network, Riot Sabbath Bloody Podcast, The Simple Man of Skinner Reconsidered, Terry T-Bone Mathley at T-Bone's Prime Cuts. Thank you so much for your support. And of course, Jorg Planer, where would we be without you? Patron Saint and Archivist of the Deep Purple Podcast. Thank you so, so much. Now, we have kind of a, a, a first on the show here, which is a repeat sponsor. So basically, this sponsor is somebody who is uh who's joined us before and uh we were kind of confused as to what the sponsor was so we um we we we, we're gonna revisit it so here we go here's our sponsor for this week I knew it was going to be this one. So there's a lot of athletics going on. Gatorade. That's right. Gatorade is our sponsor this week. Coming to you fresh out of the 90s. So we mentioned in our episode that we... It just, the file we had just said Gator. So I it was like, I don't know what the hell that means. So now that's now the know. actual commercial video. We've, if in case you're um, 
listening, uh, which you probably are because nobody watches our YouTube channel. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a Gatorade commercial that, uh, that Joe Lynn Turner did. And Jorg, of course, as soon as he heard the episode, followed up with a link to the video. And he had found it um, via one of the actresses that's in the, the video, whose name I believe is Rebecca Kordecki. And I think she had posted it on her Facebook page or who knows when, um, or, or YouTube channel, whatever it is. So uh, that answers that question. Another mystery solved here on the Deep Purple podcast, of course, not by us, but by Jorg Planer, the solver of many mysteries. Which, you know, you asked the question a few minutes ago, where would we be without Jorg? And the answer to that is we would be very wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> We'd be trucking <laughs> along doing these episodes and getting things wrong unchecked. Left and right. <laughs> <laughs> wrong, wrong, pew, 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 pew. Yeah, we still do plenty of that, but usually corrects us. If we're lucky, corrects us before we start doing the show, um, sometimes after the show is done. So there you go. But yeah, today we are here to talk about the very uh, rare and, and seldom referenced singles of Rod Evans. So this basically is a period of time where Rod released uh, a single, a promo single after leaving Deep Purple. So uh, not a ton of information about it, but basically he leaves uh, Deep Purple in July of 1969. And from 1969 to 72, he didn't do a heck of a lot musically. He went to uh, medical school in America and he stayed in America. And um, at one point this uh, single was put together and uh, as a as a promo and kind of put out there and obviously nothing really came of it and a couple of years later he started captain beyond so this is a very uh is, like we always say this will probably be one of our shorter episodes and uh although sometimes we say that and we go two and a half hours so who knows mm -hmm. but uh yeah we've got just got these uh, a single and a b-side to listen to uh, it, there's a little con well i don't want to say controversy but there's a conflict of uh, opinions there's a few different dates being bandied about as to when this was released some sources say october of 1970 i've seen november of 1970 i've also seen october of 1971 jerry bloom says it's released in october of 1971 so i tend to go with jerry he's pretty uh he's he knows his stuff and he's he's well researched so it's probably more accurate it seems unlikely that he would have just sprung right out of deep purple and just bang released this promo single right away mm. no this um, was a like uh this was billed as rod rod evans not like a band or anything it was just rod evans just rod evans a solo rod evans all right track um i did uh have some correspondence with a couple of people one of them is uh, Adrian Jarvis, who wrote the book Chasing Shadows, which I'm looking around for. And of course, I probably left it upstairs. Yeah. But um, he wrote this great book, Chasing Shadows, about trying to track down Rod Evans. And uh, in the book, he talks about uh, one of Rod's ex-girlfriends, Maria, uh, who was his girlfriend while, while he was in, uh, before Deep Purple, actually. And uh, I have also had some correspondence with Maria. And she sent me a, a note that was written in Italian by uh, one of her friends. It's kind of a some more of a more of an expert on on this era of Rod. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this roughly translated note from this Italian purveyor of of Rod Evans uh, information. I thought about sending it to your brother for translation, but I, think, <laughs> I only got this earlier today, so I didn't think we would have time. Ah. Uh. Hey, Mike, can you translate Well, this? you know, it's, yeah, he, he would have been able, that's what he, he used to do that for, um, for uh, side work was yeah. translating. But, you know, I figured you rather know, than um, bother uh, your brother, uh, um, yeah. and I, I just, yeah, he probably Google wouldn't have been able to do it anyway. He's too busy. You're like, sorry. <laughs> First yeah, time Google translate will, Google translate does a fine job. It, this, this is okay. So. Uh, the person says, uh, this single is one of the little mysteries of purple history. Virtually nothing is known. It appeared in October of 1970, so this person saying 1970, on the Capitol label, which never had anything to do with Deep Purple. 
never uh never there was never an advertisement in a magazine or an interview with rod in support although i found something that might contradict that um do you think that until the beginning of 1980 no deep purple fan was aware of it and until the internet it was practically unobtainable I remember well the excitement when I found it. The only tenuous connection is that the producer, Bobby Paris, who we'll get into later, who worked for Capitol in 1968, recorded a single for Tetragrammaton, someone we haven't talked about in a while, the uh, failed uh, label who spent $500,000 making that album cover, um, for which it is assumed that Rod knew him from the record company. So it's possible he knew this producer, Bobby Paris, from Tetragrammaton. Uh, there are two cover songs of pops of pop songs done in a traditional way, um, and the sound is not that great. <laughs> I prefer the retro where Rod sings really good and really inspired. It's a pity that um, I didn't insist on this genre. Rod was simply perfect uh, to become the new Tom Jones. I agree. Hmm. I think we've made that connection. Have we ever before. referenced him to, to well, to a crooners, yeah, but to Todd, um, Todd Jones, um, Tom Jones. Todd Jones. Um, yeah, we've, we've referenced him. I was like, who's Todd Jones? I don't know. No, but we've referenced him to being a crooner before. Sure. So it's, yep. it's kind of cool to hear that, you know, somebody else picked up on that as well, like actually described him as that. But I, I would always put him more into like the, I guess the Elvis category, but Tom, Tom yeah. Jones makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Oh we God, often, you know, Pat Boone, people like that. Yeah. We often make the, um, the Elvis comparison. So there is mm -hmm. this, um, on, uh, what you call it? DPAC.at, which we've referenced before, which has tons and tons of, of great Rod Evans, uh, information. Um, they have this article here, which I'll, let me pull up. And this article, well, actually, before I go to the article, I'll just show you real quick. This is the uh, this is the record itself, what it would have looked like. Um, I actually did order one of these. I found a copy on eBay uh, because the the copy of the audio I have it's cut off at the beginning, and every copy I've found on YouTube has that same cut off at the beginning. So it could be just that this was a promo mm -hmm. that was poorly done and it's cut off at the beginning but uh, yeah. i want to see if it's a little different so it's just a very simple 45 with a little capital record sleeve nothing crazy there's the uh, record itself the first track is hard to be without you and the second track is you can't love a child like a woman that's the b-side so then we get this article which is going to be nearly impossible to read but i can read it for you uh this was uh, from Best Songs Magazine in 1971. And it says, who exactly is Rod Evans? Well, first thing, he was born a little more than 20 years ago in Slough, England, not too far from London. He grew up somewhat of a, uh, in somewhat of a present day tradition. His folks weren't poor as dirt. He always had enough to eat. His schooling was pretty thorough and he didn't feel especially ignored or hurt by his parents. As a matter of fact, Rod always thought that his father was a great guy. He still thinks so. But olden times have changed for, for us all, Rod included. And like everyone, when he was older, Rod wanted to break home traditions and go his own way. For a time, he did train for a regular job as a CPA. Imagine that. But uh, somewhere down in those nests of figures were the musical notes he really wanted to sing. So he sang, trained by his own ear, shaped only by the outside sound of the world of music around him. Bit by bit, Rod made himself a singer. While he was learning his craft, Rod also learned respect for hardworking, ever-polishing pro. He liked Rick Nelson's steady growth as an artist. He listened earnestly to Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, uh, Chicago James Taylor. And he always gained control and knowledge and waited for his break. And as it had to, it came. He was asked to be lead singer of a new group with the shining name of Deep Purple. He took the job and things happened. An American recording contract first with Tetragrammaton and a couple of hits tunes named Hush and Kentucky Woman. Deep Purple began to be known and began to create a striking definite image. Rod gained immense practical authority from his work with them and thoroughly appreciated the good dates plus the good things along with them that were happening. But there came a time when Rod's own idea of life 
uh, of one's own became paramount. He knew he had to strike out on his own. And even though Deep Purple continued to do well, Rod was chafing at the restrictions working with the group demanded. It was time that Rod Evans went his way. So he left the group and took out a little time to think of himself in the future. He wanted to create a new career starting from square one. He wanted to become a good performer, but also a good artist like Sinatra and Tom Jones, whose hard learned professionalism he admires. He wanted to get up and sing and make his mark in his own individual way. Moreover, he realized that his solid upbringing had shaped him, had given him his own direct view of the world. He wanted security. He wanted health and non nonsense physical regime. I don't know what that means. He wanted an easygoing married life with his American wife, Pam, and as much happiness as each day can bring. Accordingly, Rod Evans' solo singer came into being. So that is kind of like a little bit of a, of a promo almost for this single, but um, obviously taking a little bit of liberties saying that he was frustrated with Deep Purple and left the group. I think we know that the actual story is a little, unfortunately, different than that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's kind of like a little marketing press release almost. And it's, it makes you wonder why, again, why this never went anywhere. Nobody ever really heard this single. Um, moving along, uh, so they, there's also this kind of famous promo image from the single. This would have been kind of pushed by Capital at the time. It's a really good picture of Rod Evans. Hunky Rod Evans really with the kind is. of longish hair with the, the leather jacket and the of course, the standard shirt unbuttoned all the way down to the navel. But that's oh, a yeah, classic Rod, Rod picture. Rod, Rod David Cassidy Evans there. He does look Rod like David Partridge Cassidy. Partridge Family Evans. <laughs> he does. He looks like he could be in the Partridge Family in this. He's a good-looking guy. Yeah, Groves. That's and that's a great picture of Rod. No, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Take it back. He's a he's a groovy-looking guy. He's groovy. <laughs> ah, he's groovy-looking cat. Um, he's a groovy looking guy yeah there was also and these kind of pop up from time to time so there was there was this weird bootleg release of this in the 90s on vinyl seeming to be in Czechoslovakia hmm. and I always wondered I, I've always seen kind of these images paired up with uh early like when I was looking up stuff for like Maze and MI5 and stuff like the early uh uh Rod Evans and Ian Pace's early band and it's from these weird bootlegs with which um, I guess I'm going to call the booby bootlegs because they're just, for some reason, it's naked women on the cover. I mean, uh, for some reason, probably to sell records, um, uh, which is <laughs> really a thing, <laughs> which is an age old tactic. But it's funny because these were released in like the 90s, but they look like they're from the 60s. Uh, so they've got this right here, which is just some boobies uh it says it's funny because this is rod evans and then this is a naked woman uh, with kind of a bluish tint and that's like the cover <laughs> of the of the single and if you look at there's ones of these for like some maze songs there's probably four maybe five of these different ones it's very uh very odd so that's Rod Evans. It's funny if just thinking about it as being like an individually sanctioned thing. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really go with the, the music or anything. And then the back cover is just side A, hard to be without you. Side B, you can't love a child like a woman, uh, which is kind of a little bit of a creepy song title, if you ask me. Um, uh -huh. um, and then the record itself has some more different boobies <laughs> on the on the record. <laughs> And on the other side, it just says oh. Evans. <laughs> they didn't even put his full name, Evans. <laughs> and this one says copyright. We can't be bothered. We can't, we write. can't be bothered to put Rod on there. We, just... we only have. We won't have enough ink to print all those boobies if we if we waste it writing Rod. <laughs> um. <laughs> the budget only allows for boobies. No Rod. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh the booby bootlegs um <laughs> so bad and it doesn't even have the full names of the songs it says side a it's hard to be and then it says side b you can't love <laughs> they didn't even write the whole names of the songs 
I wish I could do a Czechoslovakian accent. Some guy smoking a cigar. Ah, save money on the ink. Less printing of words, more printing of boobies. <laughs> but this says on it, it's funny, even though it's a bootleg, it says copyright 1971. Like, oh, we want to respect the copyright, even though we're, you know, <laughs> illegally distributing this with boobies on it. And, Very strange. and like just desecrating like the, the names and the words of like the song, the artist. Yeah, I mean, I mean who, else. who wants to be bothered with getting like the full name of the artist? Or I can now I'm kind of the more I'm looking at this, I kind of want like one of these for the collection. But I, I think there was a very few made. Um, but yeah, these if you're well, wondering that's, in that's why image search, like, what's up? The I was um, I was thinking that it's like really some things that are like so horribly wrong are actually the best collectibles to have yeah just because they're they're like unique like there's like there's so much wrong with this and <laughs> there probably weren't a lot printed that it's it's probably just as rare to get as the original single like it'd be a really interesting thing to have like in your collection you know i got the regular and, and you know fairly and, easily i can't find one of these and you know plus you know boobies and, and boobies of course <laughs> that's always the answer um, Which you know anybody could find millions of them anywhere on the internet now. Just yeah, this was like the late '90s. It's like it's not like there was any uh, shortage of way, like why I I don't know. <laughs> Things were different in Czechoslovakia in the '90s. So, so different. So that's kind of a little bit of the background on this. It's 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 definitely a. Um, an interesting it's interesting that this happened and th that he hooked up with um that he hooked up with uh, somebody that apparently he must have known through tetragrammaton to record these and um the first song is uh, like i said hard to be without you it was written by george fishoff who was a juilliard grad uh the youngest composer on broadway in 1970 he has a lots of credits on discogs mm. including uh, a song called 98.6 which was uh, recorded by a number of different ar artists, including Barry St. John, our uh, butterfly ball friend from, from way back when. So uh, hmm. very interesting. He also wrote, wrote the song, We Were Made for Each Other by the Monkees and the song Lazy Day by Spanky and Our Gang. Do you, do you know Spanky and Our Gang? <laughs> um, like the original? Well, the Spanky and Our Gang, like it's- uh, was, it a, was it a band? Yeah, like, like um, I, the only reason I know it is because my dad, um, it was like a pop group in the 60s, and my dad had one of their records, and I just remember the album cover very, um, very distinctly, nope. and it just it was just funny because nope. it was called Spanky and our, our Gang, um, so uh, yeah, it was the album that he had, know, like the, you know, it was like a weird, it was like almost like a, I want to say it was like an old west sort of or is, it was like it looked like an old-timey cartoon sort of thing what was the, what was the name mm -hmm. of the album um like to get to know you uh, yeah it was from the late 60s and it just had like a bunch of it looked like one of the whatchamacallit spanking our gang the uh or the what the hell was that what the hell was spanking our gang called alfalfa and all them that just what you called them, Spanky and our gang. Wasn't that was that it was what it was like, called? Um, uh, like, yeah, it was it? Yeah, there was Spanky and our gang. It was like a like a a group of uh, a group of like a like a group of kid actors that yeah. you know starred in a bunch of like I don't know if Fuck they were movies and... or like shorts and you know or, or stuff like that or um or shows. Yeah, I think in the thirties. Yeah, my, well, my dad had this album anyway, and I don't think I ever even listened to it. Um but I do have it. It's actually somewhere right beside me here. I'd have to, I'll have to pull it out and we'll have to give it a, we'll give, we'll do a bonus episode on that album. Um, give it a whirl. But yeah, I don't know if there's anyone in there that was like super uh, well known, uh, but interesting, uh, interesting. The only reason I bring it up is because I, I know that album, my dad had it. It has no relevance to anything else. So, um, so yeah, George Fishoff wrote this first song, Hard to Be Without You. Um, and uh, we should take a listen, right? Let's see. Yeah. Where, where is this track here? All right. I'm going to, whoops. I'm going to pull this track up. 
and we can uh, we can take a listen again like the first second or so is like going to be cut off um mm -hmm. from this recording uh but the real version probably has it so here we go Oh my God! This is Rod this and totally Rod Partridge Family-ish. Yeah. <laughs> this does. It sounds like his Partridge Family phase, like really early '70s, like kind of bubblegum pop. He's got. Listen to that guitar. got the voice for this i mean it's perfect oh honestly like it's it's produced a lot like david cassidy i'm not trying to even be funny now like he could have been like rod evans could have been keith partridge <laughs> could have been or should have been yeah, my, i like to might say should have been he might have been a little too old I was in the early 20s. He should I think have been Dave, like the uh, he should have been David like their Kim. their cousin that came in. For David Cassidy episodes. was around the same age, give or take. Well, Rod Evans would have been 1970. He would have been in his early 20s. Yeah. This is not what I expected. Very poppy, and he sounds really good. Nice horn arrangement on this. go there's there's rod evans just in his element singing wow, the... this like unlike anything else that i think he's recorded yeah it's we... funny because this is depending on what source you believe this is either like a year or two before he would be um fronting captain beyond which talk about a little bit of a departure from that well yeah but i mean <laughs> you, you got like deep purple which was when he was in, it was really kind of, you know, psychedelic and then really psychedelic ish. And then kind of like heavy toward like the third album and then Captain Beyond, which was really kind of like uh, trippy acid rock type of stuff, like prog rock, like all these long arrangements, really heavy, like early seventies stuff. And then in between, he just stopped off at this uh, just kind of pop rock, like, it literally does. It sounds like that, that exactly the way it was produced, that early 70s pop, like, uh, like Partridge Family type of stuff. And honestly, like the way that it was produced and like his vocals, like, I don't honestly don't think they've ever sounded better. I think he was really suited to that. Like he could have gone down this route and like really done well with it. Like I'm really surprised at how good it is because he was in that wheelhouse of those types of singers. Yeah, it's kind of surprising that he uh, with this. that he didn't get more traction with this because it does it does come off really well. Like it sounds like he's a lot more versatile. Like we just keep finding these different sides of him that are like way versatile. Like I mean, he was that kind of like prog rocky psychedelic singer, and like wow, he's also a pop singer. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, you know, we've we've heard him let really let loose on some of those Captain Beyond tracks, where he's really starting to get into his element in that zone as as well and uh yeah he's got he's got so much uh so much depth to him it's it's a shame that more stuff wasn't released um and as as we noted before this was produced by bobby paris who was uh, uh i believe he was uh 
he was known as the blue eyed soul singer from the golden keys. I guess that was a, that was a band and he produced some singles for the Capitol Capitol records up until the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, so interesting stuff. So if you flip this bad boy over, you get to the second side and that is uh, the B side obviously. And it's called, you can't love a child like a woman, which is uh, yeah, I hope not. Um, kind of a controversial title there so let's listen to this song and see oh before we start oh my goodness am i uh, am i forgetting something so this was this song was written by um uh, the the previous song was written by gary F- uh gary <laughs> george fishoff and somebody else and that somebody else is tony powers uh, so it's the connection there. <laughs> some, some, someone who we have referenced before on the show. He he also mm-hmm. co-wrote the song 98.6 with George Fishoff and wrote what song, John? Odyssey. Odyssey off of off of uh, Songs from the Elder by Kiss. One of our favorite <laughs> favorite songs, oh. if only for the episode of Pot of Thunder <laughs> that covers it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Go listen to that one. If you want to laugh a lot. Yeah. And there's a video too, uh, of Tony powers version of, of Odyssey on YouTube that you can find. It's just like him in a trench coat, walking around the street, smoking and singing this song about (laughs) about being on an Odyssey. It's quite a song. Mm. Uh, but yeah, Tony powers has got a, he's got a ton of credits on, on discogs. So, um, the song 98.6, I think it needs to be checked out. Um, which is funny name for a song because you you think they're just talking about 98.6 right that's your mm-hmm. normal body temperature like it's just funny to write a song about a normal body temperature you've got songs like cold as ice and cold hearted snake and you've got songs like hot blooded and all that and this is just like 98.6 i'm just like norm- <laughs> everything's fine <laughs> <laughs> everything's fine normal i'm not like turned down i'm not all jacked up i'm not i'm not a reptilian like i'm not heartbroken you know it's just like it's all good i'm just going to work every day feeling good just going to work taking my vitamins (laughs) taking my centrum (laughs) centrum silver centrum silver exactly that's 50 plus maybe we'll be taking that soon i wouldn't know yet (laughs) yeah but we will soon enough Uh. Uh, just play the damn track all right (laughs) next track uh you can't love a child like a woman oh my goodness what you ought to mean it says right on the record not for sale so we're just giving these bad boys out I guess really don't know where they're going with this <laughs> I mean his vocals are good again oh of course and it's still that same musical direction as the first side yep really good uh, horn arrangements on these songs Like, Rod sounds so comfortable in this. Like, it doesn't sound like he's out of his element at all. No. 
Like, it just sounds so good. I'm really enjoying this. And I can see where they're coming I mean, with this, the, uh, uh, the new Tom Jones thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not really paying attention to the lyrics, but it's like, I don't know, I feel like the lyrics were different. It would, the song would be less awkward. <laughs> the title of the song, too. Like, yeah, how how weird is that? That, like, he probably could have done a whole album of this kind of stuff and had that, like, picture on the front, you know, yeah. the whole heartthrob thing. And serious. Or just, or like, just him with, like, a like, sweater, cause... like, by a fireplace. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's like he could have, like... Yeah, I mean, they, they had other songwriters, like like they did with bands like that, doing the songs. They could have just, like you know got him but you know i'm sure it was a bunch of studio musicians and other writers and everything and they could have packaged him and and like you know sold him as that kind of artist um i mean who knows what circumstances led to it not being a full album of that recorded but there's like i can think of like i can't think of any examples but there's like so many artists out there that recorded this type of kind of album around that time like early 70s and it just kind of fits right in it's too bad that the you know it seemed like it wasn't the right promotion or a push around it to get going um and then it's weird how we went from this to like captain beyond yeah i mean i'm glad he did because that stuff kicks ass but yeah, it's definitely, um, it's definitely, uh, um, I, I really enjoy it too. Those would be a great album to listen to, just hearing him take a break between Deep Purple and Captain Beyond to do this kind of crooner act. And as I clicked mm-hmm. on this link, I'm seeing all more of these booby bootlegs here. There's one for Finders Keepers, which was, ba- that was Trapeze before they changed their name. There's one for Screaming Lord Such. And then there's one for The Maze, which was Ian Pace and... Uh, Rod Evans band before they both joined Roundabout. So it's funny mm-hmm. that they're and they're all the kind of the same style. So you've got this uh, Friday kind of Monday, which I think we even listened to in one of our episodes. Um, Glenn Hughes thing with this, these all these weird naked models, and I can't tell if they're actual like old pinup pictures or if they just like posed somebody in the '90s to look like they were like '50s and '60s, but. Interesting stuff. The booby bootlegs. If anyone has any more information on all these <laughs> weird booby bootlegs that were apparently from the, they all have the catalog, catalog HR archive on them. They seem to be from the Czech Republic. Uh, let us know. Send us your pictures. Tell us more about these these bootlegs. Um, but yeah, that's that's the uh, the very yeah, send, brief. Send, na- send nature pic. Send nature pictures. <laughs> I already well, I already have the pictures. <laughs> They're right here. <laughs> They're right here on Discogs. <laughs> Send them more. <laughs> I'm looking here right now. Harlem Shuffle, boobies, just everywhere. Um, so I think we'll have to do an episode on the booby bootlegs one day. And just figure out what. There's got to be like a story, right? There's got to be a story behind why, why these weird random, like. Uh, bootlegs of acts from Deep Purple members before they were in Deep Purple are like very rare items. Like, and it's just it seems to be those like five or so. Like, what's the deal behind this? I need somebody in the Czech Republic to get back to us and tell us what the story is with with the booby bootlegs. I feel like this is a missed opportunity if like Coverdale doesn't have any of these. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, like if they had one for like government or vintage sixty seven or something, but not seeing a, a Coverdale one. Well, he probably like he took care of that on his own album covers. <laughs> Although he was a little more restrained. <laughs> These are just straight up just one of them's got a little bit more frontal nudity than the the one that we showed on the show. Um yeah. anyway, that's uh the Rod Evans singles. It's pretty interesting stuff. 
And uh, like we said, kind of a yeah. uh, kind of a, a shorter episode. So I did um, I did reach out on Twitter to see if anyone had any any Q, anything for a Q and A because I anticipated mm-hmm. that this would probably be a little bit shorter. So let's see what uh, see what people have here. There's my post. Looking for my my post where I'm asking questions. Okay, so. Are these just um, anything or are these rod specific or? No, just anything. Just anything. Uh, okay. David Liao asks, what's your least favorite Deep Purple album? I mean, I feel like we haven't, we haven't covered them all yet, but. Yeah. If you I have mean, one, we, the, if you have one, we from, haven't covered or from the ones we've have covered either way. Uh, I mean, I don't know from the, from the, all the ones that we've covered. I mean, say the, most disappointing is probably who do we think we are i think i've made that public record really more like more disappointing than the first album well i mean the the first few albums are like well you know what i even put the third album in there because i like the third self-titled but the first two are not my favorites but it's just like i feel like i dislike who do we think we are just because like you knew that there was that that potential it, there it, it didn't it to deliver be on what you were hoping for yeah i mean it's like all the elements were there and it was just like sheer infighting and 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 laziness and just you know that that made it just not as good an album as it could have been and then you heard them like what a year later or less on burn and you heard blackmore like in rainbow and you're just like see they still got it like they could have put out good material but they just didn't they couldn't at that point Mm -hmm. so so that's that's why i would pick that one because the other ones at least they were doing something new they were like maybe they weren't the best but they were kind of like they were fresh they were still trying some kind of new crazy stuff that makes sense as far as like not not delivering on what you were hoping for I would have yeah. to probably just go with the first album as like far as like, if I'm, if I'm thinking of everything we've covered until this point, as far as mm-hmm. one that I wouldn't necessarily want to listen to. Um, but you know, I've listened to um, since we covered whoosh uh, and it's, it's only been what, two weeks, but I've mm-hmm. probably listened to that like two dozen times, you know, like I'm really digging that one, mm-hmm. um, you know, and thinking of other ones, like some of the other maybe, the dark horses of the morse era or like like maybe like rapture of the deep and bananas and albums that that get probably more crap than they deserve i'd much rather pick up one of those and listen to it and and i've enjoyed those albums um more than the first i don't know those well enough so i couldn't i'm 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 only speaking to the yeah the ones that we've reviewed just to be fair yeah, and I, I haven't heard, I, I'm not, you know, I haven't heard those a million times, but mm-hmm. I've heard them enough times to, to, to want to go back to them and listen to them again. And like the first, the first, deep, I, I'd almost rather w- listen to Book of Taliesin more than the first one, because I feel like the ones with any, any album where they're doing covers just kind of loses me a little bit. Mm, yeah. Um, next up, we've got Frederick Gonzalez Olson asks your favorite official live versions of classic songs, such as Highway Star, Smoke on the Water, and why? Is it like those in particular, or um, no, um, like your like I I the way I read this is like what's like can you think of a live version on an official release, like say made in Japan, made in Europe, whatever? Oh yeah. Um, of a, of a, of a classic song that you, that you really love. Oh yeah. I'll go with, um, made, made in Europe. Um, you fool no one mm. is, is like always been one of my favorites. I never get sick of it. Like that, that drum intro with the cowbells and like, yep. you know, Richie, like, you know, like, uh, improvising. And then like when they, they stop and Richie just rips into that solo and then they do the, the slow blues thing and then they go back into it and, it's just like I love it. That's that's definitely always been one of my faves. Um, I would have to go with. I think "Child in Time" off of "Made in Japan" is incredible. 
And Ch- I would actually, you know, I would go with it's well, I guess he's saying an official live version because the, uh, right. the Denmark child in time, I think I might prefer even a little bit more. Um, right. And then burn off of California jam. I love that live version. Like just them mm. coming out and out of the gate and just um, killing it with that song. Really, really dig that one. Um, <laughs> Arthur Smith asks, does anyone know what David Coverdale, Richie Blackmore and Glenn Hughes are up to? Cause Coverdale keeps posting all these pictures and it'll be like him, a picture of him, a picture of Richie Blackmore, a picture of Glenn Hughes no explanation and he's done this several times now and it's like it's like a it's not a picture of them from back in the day it's like a modern pictures of the three of them three separate pictures no reference yeah. so everyone's obviously like oh they're gonna do some sort of mark three reunion or whatever um so obviously i don't know what they're up to um but wouldn't that be incredible if they got to get got together and I mean, I guess they couldn't get together. <laughs> they, they could, uh, they could all go up to Hook City and hang out with Coverdale. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the hell they are up to. I, I, obviously, it's kind of like a, it would be a fantasy to think of the three of them getting together, and uh, you know, it's been toyed with like, would Ian Pace play drums for them, or if they get like Derek Turinian or something to to keyboards and do some sort of like Mark three. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be necessarily interested in seeing them get back together and rehash their old stuff, but it'd be cool to see them work. Even if they got together to do one track, that would be incredible. But I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't know. I don't know either. Yeah. I don't know either. Um, my wife asks on Twitter, how bitter on a scale of one to 10 <laughs> Uh, was the knowledge that you had to plant surprise hydrangea bushes when you came home from work yesterday. So yeah, I came home from work and she had, my brother-in-law had dug up some hydrangeas from the front of their house and she wanted to plant them in front of our house. So I'd come home from work, I'd showered, and then I had to go out in like the heat and like dig giant pits and put these hydrangea bushes in. So on a, on a scale of one to 10, I would think 8.5 is how annoyed I was to have to do that. <laughs> Uh, after a shower, I would have been ten plus. Yeah, needless to say, I like, took a. Damn it, I had, now I got a shower again. <laughs> I had to take. Yeah, I had to take another shower. I was like, it was one of those things where, like, for like two minutes, I was like, I could probably get away with doing this and not taking another shower. And then I was dripping with sweat. I had mud all over my knees. I'm like, yeah, there's no way. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> um, that was fun. That was I a got fun question. I've got uh, Jim Massa wrote a good question that I don't think we're going to answer because I think we really need to wait till we get to the albums, but how would you rank the seven Morse era albums? I mean, I've got a rough idea of how I would do it now, but I feel like, I feel like it doesn't count until we actually cover it on the show. You know what I mean? Like actually sit down get those writing mm-hmm. ratings into the spreadsheet. And uh, one, th- one thing I would really love to do is a ranking the albums, all 21 albums uh, from you know, giving your one through 21 and my one through 21 and just comparing notes, that'd be a yeah. really fun episode. But I feel like, yeah, yeah I, I, mean, could, I can't speak on them anyways, because I don't know them well enough. Yeah. I mean, I know them, I know them well enough off of how I'm feeling now, but I feel like even the albums like that, we know, like the back of our hand talking through them on a show and doing an entire episode on each one really kind of opened my eyes to so many things that I, didn't really consider with them and, and, and formed new opinions and things like that. So I really would want to see how it went in the course of the show before he answered that. But I think it's a great mm-hmm. question. Um, ranking each, even also just ranking each of the Mark albums altogether. You know, obviously Joe Lynn Turner would mm-hmm. be an easy episode. Um, it's the best and the worst. Um, but that's a good, uh, definitely a good question. Um, Mm -hmm. what else do we have here? A couple other ones. Um, Favorite, um, favorite purple live album released after nobody's perfect. That's a tough one. I actually honestly haven't heard a ton of them past nobody's perfect. I've heard like the live at Olympia 96, which is really good. 
I mean, in full, like, I mean, who asked that yeah. question, by the way? Oh, I'm sorry. That was um, Evan Robinson. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I've heard, I mean, obviously I've heard things I've heard, uh, you know, I haven't heard you know, like really in full because live albums have never really been my yeah like, i've my never favorite. i've never been a crazy um live album guy even stuff like i mean i, so, I um, even like yeah. something like made in japan i just it's not something that i'm gonna necessarily put on every day like i i, I kind of like studio versions like i i have nothing against live albums and yeah. i like live performances but i i kind of almost would rather watch a live performance than listen to it not that I'm turning the sound down, but oh yeah, like something like Denmark or California Jam, where you can watch the video and see what they're doing rather than just listening to it. Oh yeah, I think the oh only... yeah because I mean like I mean we already we already watched California Jam, which I mean let's face it, like those ratings for us that we were rating the songs were so high because mm -hmm. of the visuals if we were just yep. hearing it the music it would we'd still like it and it would still be good but i mean it wouldn't have been nearly as exciting without uh you know watching you know glenn running around or like you know richie uh you know smashing the camera and like you know coverdale doing all his like you know really emotional um you know uh, body language and all that kind of stuff like and just seeing the, the the crowd too like the shots from their pov of like the crowd and everything just being so amazed by all that and the tree behind ian pace and like just <laughs> all that funny stuff too you know it's like that's that really makes it so it's like we could listen to denmark and and think like wow that's amazing but i mean just seeing it even though it's not as visually spectacular it is in a different way so mm -hmm. like i'm with you i would rather watch a live performance well, that you brings know, up especially a, ones that were like recorded like raw like that you know it brings up an interesting question though like, what about other bands like uh, like are there any i because there's like i can think of a handful of live albums that i really listen to a ton of and um mm -hmm. well, are there any for you that like really really resonate with you i mean <sighs> there there aren't too many i mean uh, you know of course i i loved the the kiss alive albums mm -hmm. um one and two um i mean well john one you is, know, you, one know they, is you know they overdubbed stuff you know. on that right are you okay with that <laughs> yeah i'm okay with it <laughs> That's the thing too, is, is it's just like people's things about live albums is just like, you know, oh, this was recorded in sound check, this bum note was fixed, the crowd was piped oh, yeah. in, this was fake. I don't care. Well, even you know, on Nobody's it's Perfect, like, somebody um, pointed the, out the, the other day, there was the, it was the anniversary of one of the, I forgot what song on Nobody's Perfect that they were recorded. And somebody brought up a point that I'd forgotten, which is they took on that Nobody's Perfect, they took like half of a song from one night and half of a song from another night and splice them together to make one song. Like, so like, yeah. who care? but who cares? I mean, I, I always loved the kiss alive album, you know, in the early days of my liking them because, you know, it was, it was really early document of them. And, and it really is well recorded. I mean, whether it's mm -hmm. all real or not, but I mean, um, if you, if you jump ahead to the uh, jump ahead to the nineties, like there were actually two albums that I really loved. And one of them was the last and live by mm -hmm. Dio, which mm -hmm. was like documented. I think it was the angry machine store. It was like his lesser popular albums when he had uh, that guitarist, Tracy G, which, you know, not everybody was a huge fan of but i was mm -hmm. and i saw him on that tour and i really liked that album and i think i really liked that album because that was the tour and you know the era of dio that i was like really involved with you know and um there was the same thing with there was another one maybe around the same time by wasp called double live assassins mm -hmm. which again was like um a, a tour or tours that I saw them on and like a version of the band that I was involved with, like that, like I was following at the time. It wasn't like, you know, Oh, they were like an album, like a live performance from like 84. And I was too young to see them. Like I would like, that was like my era of the band. So I remember mm -hmm. really 
being into those live albums. And I mean, listening back, I mean, at least the Wasp one, I know it was overproduced because I'm like, wow, like that sounds like, you know, Blackie doing like background vocals, which is impossible because <laughs> he's is doing foreground <laughs> vocals. <laughs> Exactly. He's like, you know, he'd be saying they would be like these, like, you know, like a chorus of like, and it's all, it sounds like him, which kind of sounds impossible. So obviously they sweetened it up a little bit, but um, yeah, those were, those were like the kind of the full albums that I really liked. And then Kiss Alive 3 was another one, which I really enjoyed because that, you know, was, I, that was my very first tour. So mm -hmm. I'd seen them on that one. So that was like a document of like, you know, the, tour that i saw them on so did this question even extend to other bands or did we just start no, talking I, about I, just, it? I, I i took some liberties didn't you um get in trouble for no. bringing in a oh. wasp tape to your uh your private catholic high school and playing it <laughs> or did i make that story uh, well no i tried it i tried it because um you know <laughs> the uh the teacher and uh, because of course it was a private catholic high school and um so we had re religion class and mm -hmm. I don't remember even what the, and of course, religion, by the way, was only one religion, you know? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't and, um, world religions. It wasn't... <laughs> <laughs> Today we're no. going to no, <laughs> no. talk about Hinduism. <laughs> they, were not they were not teaching us about the Buddha or anything else. It was a gear toward one religion folks. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, uh, I can't remember what this, was trying to teach us the lesson of or something, but they're just like, you know, bring in like, like a song or something that means something to you or bring in a tape or whatever. And so I wasn't interested in anything else except shock and awe. So I brought in my cassette single for wasp animal fuck like a beast, which had the, the, the painting of blackie and the chainsaw on his crotch, you know, kind of going like this, like the, the the band single or whatever and oh, um they never played it surprisingly <laughs> they never they never played it you should be like coward i don't <laughs> i don't remember this just like oh you could show me these pictures of like christ hanging off a cross but you can't um but no i like and i mean I, we were like what, like seventh or eighth grade or whatever so i was just trying like i wasn't actually bringing in stuff that i liked i was just bringing in stuff to be a, a jerk you know yep. <laughs> to be like yeah hey, what do you think of this like father <laughs> whoever brother whoever and um they did not approve um they did not play it i don't think i got in trouble but they were just kind of like yeah we're not no yeah, I think I remember that. my, you're not, you're my cousin getting... telling because my cousin was in your class and I remember him <laughs> telling me, Oh, John brought in fuck like a beast. <laughs> it's like oh that's great. Um I am great. really surprised I didn't get in get in trouble for that. Yeah, I am um, too honest to be honest. I thought this ended with you having like a year's <laughs> worth of detention. <laughs> No, they were probably just like, he's going to burn in hell anyways. Like, that's his detention. He's, oh, that one, Matola, he's a lost cause. Don't worry about him. Don't even, <laughs> don't even get mad at him if he met. He's going to hell. It's, it's, <laughs> it's fine. There'll be an eternity of flames and poking for him, you know, the pitchforks and the. Um, yeah, we'll see who yeah, has the so last laugh. Anyways. Funny man. <laughs> I think for like, but, um, for live albums, know? for me, I. I don't yeah you like like yeah like like I said I, I I like I didn't get as into made in Japan as everyone else did which I know is like sacrilege in the deep purple community like I mm -hmm. I like it I, I've listened to it plenty of times but it's not like it wasn't like a go-to for me like others but I found like I got mm -hmm. the live albums that I really listened to the most are probably ones that were entry points for me like tribute I listened to tribute like a ton. Mm, I forgot about that. But that was that kind one. of like yeah, almost my, my entry point for Ozzy. Like I, I listened to tribute all the time. I remember playing it. Like I'd be at my desk, like drawing or doing whatever and listening to it. And my dad would be like across the room at his computer. And I remember him even listening to it and getting into it, you know, and him being like, wow, that guy could really play guitar. Um, and I, and I, that's remember, how we met too. When you got the CD. For yeah. It. I got the CD that you just happened to be at my cousin that we just talked about Jeff's house yeah. who lived next door yeah. and you, you were visiting and you had, and you hadn't 
so I got the CD in that day in the mail through like Columbia House or whatever, and you checked it out. Um, yeah. But yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, speak of the devil. Old Nate in his jean jacket, and you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My jean jacket and oh, my oh, speak, speak, speak of the devil. Mullet. Speak of the devil. <laughs> I I, I listen. Oh, to the, how could I forget that? And that one was a little different because I did know yeah. the Sabbath songs, but I really th- that was just like a fun because Ozzy's oh it goes with you the Fillmore we used to get shit faced every night a few groupies oh like he was always like th- throwing in all those um, things like that so I listened yeah. to that a ton and the only other one that really jumps to mind is um, that I listened to a lot was uh, Frank Zappa Broadway the Hard Way which was another one where it was mm-hmm. like. I had a ton of Zappa before I got that, but all the songs on that album are songs I wasn't familiar with. And he does like a, a live version of uh, murder by numbers uh, by sting, or I don't know if it's sting or the police. Mm-hmm. Um, and sting actually comes out on stage and sings it. And it's like incredible because I, I'm not a big sting fan like at all, but the way that Zappa mm-hmm. like arranged it and, and had, had him sing it was it's just incredible but it's a really good live performance and zappa's band obviously is incredible so those are the ones that jump out at me again not really deep purple related how could i have forgotten about, how could i have forgotten about speak of the devil though that was like one of my favorite that that was actually i remember getting that before i ever got a black sabbath album so all yep. of my sabbath i heard those versions first oh really and yeah and um and i still love that album even though i know it's like this heavily edited Mm -hmm. problematic album from a live (laughs) standpoint it's like you know it's mostly considered by people not even a live album because i think like i could be wrong um but i had heard like i had read or heard something recently um, probably rise episode Rye did a great episode on it in 1983 episode i think I think, you know what? I think it was, I think it yep. was rise. Yeah. Because I was really like, I was hanging on yet. Yeah, it was because I was hanging on to that one and I was like, Oh, I got to hear this. And he was just like, it's like, like, I think almost all of it was recorded in sound check and it sounds like it was a like, nightmare crowd noise yeah. <laughs> was added later. And yeah, I mean, it, like you, you listen to it and it's just like, it doesn't matter because I mean, it's no. like the versions of the songs on there to this day. I just, I think that they're great. It doesn't matter like how you how you got there it's like the the end result is still i think fantastic i still love it and it's and it's ozzy like so you don't I, like me and jeff and scott we would always like joke because like we didn't he says oh, remember the film maurice like we didn't know what he was saying we thought he was saying you remember phil maurice like it was a guy named phil maurice <laughs> <laughs> so for years we were like thought it was like oh is this guy i don't know who phil maurice like he used to get shit face with him every night that's all i know but he's talking about the club <laughs> um so, no so well, like, uh, yeah we didn't know what the phil maurice was either when we were when we were kids yeah. i i remember like when i was talking like uh, jeff thought it was hilarious because i used to think he was talking about the film maurice yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly that's right. I forgot. Like he used to watch this film, Maurice. Like Do you the remember film the film Maurice? Maurice? Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, we're just like yeah, you know, it's just like oh yeah, like the you know, and then the the sequel, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's like I mean, because you know, when you're like twelve, thirteen, you don't know what you know what the hell they're talking about. No, how the hell would we, <laughs> twelve years old, know what the film Maurice was? exactly or the Fillmore West well, we would have a better shot of than knowing the Fillmore West I guess but yeah um, but yeah. yeah it was it was just like the 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 stage banter was like legendary whether it was like contrived or not and like Brad Gillis is playing is to this day is like you know yeah. still incredible on that album I think yeah for sure for sure um yeah I don't know that might be all the kind of uh off the wall questions we have that we could potentially answer um a lot uh, this all of these questions sparked a lot of uh qu- dialogue already on the twitter uh, in the, uh, on our twitter account so you can check it out there um mm-hmm. but yeah um it's kind of how it goes that's uh that's rod evans that's how we feel about live ozzy albums and uh yeah i feel like we're we're just kind of recovering from our summer our summer break here our 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 paid time off that's granted to us by the deep dive podcast network and um we'll get into some <laughs> yeah we got 
we'll get into yeah, some more critical like, recordings you know, next sailing into i guess sailing into fall and before you know it it'll be the 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 on the holiday episode part two and all that great stuff that's right we'll see what it looks like this year yes so and um yeah yep that's uh that's that's but yeah anyway <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you can tell we're just like i don't end it off Rod, if you're listening to this, please come out of come out of obscurity and get yes. in touch with us. Yeah, get in touch with us. We 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 want to talk to you so bad. We want to tell your story. We want to talk about a- anything you want to talk about. I'll write your biography for you. Whatever you want. Like we, we just want we want to bring your story to the world. Um, if anyone out there ha- knows uh, Rod or can get in touch with them, just hey, just let them know. This is, or anybody this, that knows anybody this, that knows rod the show the deep purple podcast they love you they would love to talk to you you don't even have to be on the show if you just want to talk to us and have it be um you know we could tell your story after the fact whatever you're comfortable with we want to do we love rod evans and at this point god i don't think there's anything else other than maybe some potential down the line like live captain beyond thing or something we we don't have much other rod evans to cover so here we are we're, we haven't even covered yeah. the perfect strangers album yet and we're finding ways to just dive into more rod evans because we we love you so much rod so come on our show we're Be begging we're begging we'll, be, we'll give you all of our <laughs> patreon money for that month very enticing i'm sure if you you can come on yeah, video just or like, I don't need your damn Patreon money. <laughs> exactly. We you don't have to come on Patreon if you don't want to show us that you're bald headed and happy. As I believe Nick Simper said. So anyway. I just still think that that's funny. Why would he why would he say that? <laughs> I, don't I don't know. I don't it's know. It's just why. like, so um how how's Nate been? Well, he's got a beard and he's happy. <laughs> It's like okay, what does the beard have to do with anything? Like, <laughs> well, I think it. I think it would be. It's a, it, It's just. A, it's a fact that's kind of surprising because you think of Rod. The last time you saw him, you know, with, with the hair and everything, he has he has a good, nice head of hair, as we saw in the in the um, in the sexy Rod Evans picture we showed earlier. It's a good looking man, nice head of hair, and uh, it's kind of surprising to hear that Ruby. he's bald headed. So that's probably why why they threw that in there. Well, hoping that he's happy, healthy, that Absolutely. somebody that knows him, that knows someone that knows someone that knows him or however you put it, will hear this and be like, hey, Rod, you got some big fans out there. Yeah, Six Degrees um, of Rod Evans. Because, I mean, he knows, he knows he has big fans out there. Just, he come on, Rod. It's been, it's been 40 years. It's time to, it's time to tell your story. Come, come on. Come on, break the please. silence break the silence break the come silence. on it's, yeah now's the time to now's the time to beg he's got to be bored as hell with covid going on come on that's right he's got to be well, like the rest in, of us well he's retired you i know? heard he's retired but if he's still in the medical field he wouldn't be bored but um maybe he's coming he's you know he was yeah, a respiratory retired be but like to he get was out. A, but he was a respiratory therapist so maybe like i know here in illinois huh. the governor put out like a call like saying hey anybody that used to work in hospitals and wants to come back come back and we'll we'll waive the fees for this and that because we need the help maybe he went back to just say maybe he's maybe he's in the hospitals right now saving lives like a goddamn hero maybe that's what he's doing who knows i didn't know i forgot about did you ever mention that that he was a respiratory i don't know if i did in, uh, that kind of doctor that's that's, that's the word actually the word on the street is that he was a respiratory things. therapist i mean I'm, and i'm sure that's got to be uh uh in high demand these days with everything going on hmm. so yeah, I mean, Rod, if... Well, I mean, if that's true, then, I mean, that's interesting to speculate what he, you know, might be thinking or doing right now about everything, yeah. Yeah, we could, Rod, we could talk about COVID. Come on the show and we'll, we'll talk about your music. We'll talk about, you know, what your theories are about COVID. Whatever you want to talk about, we're, we're game. We're happy to, happy to do it. Great way to tell your story and um, get 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 it out there to the world and all the people that are have been dying to hear from you and we're we're very discreet mm. we're very we're professional we i we haven't given out i haven't uh posted claude schnell's phone number have i no we haven't we haven't given we haven't uh given away don aries secret 
lair hideout. Like all the, those secrets remain locked in the vault of the Deep Purple podcast and will never be revealed because we protect our sources, Rod, and we will protect you because we love you. And we think you uh, gave us some great music to listen to. And we want to celebrate that with you. Come on the show. This has turned into an open plea to Rod Evans to come on our show. (laughs) As we go completely off the rails here. But anyway, as we promised, a shorter, a little bit of a shorter episode. Uh, You know, only two songs to cover. The, The final two songs from Rod Evans. And, you know, like I said, maybe one day mm-hmm. in the future we'll cover some live Captain Beyond or, or Deep Purple with Rod. But um, for the most part, we've, we're kind of wrapping up his his um, his musical output and uh, of, of all of which mm-hmm. I have thoroughly enjoyed. Me too. All right then, my friend. We will chat with you next week. Okay. I'll see you then. All right. Thank you for listening to the Deep Purple Podcast. If you like what you hear and would like more episodes in the future, please donate on Patreon to support the show. You can also give us a rating on iTunes to help new people discover the show. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for show updates. See deeppurplepodcast.com for more details. Thank you for listening.